I can't keep it anymore! This is Chris LaFon, otherwise called Airsoft Fatty on the internet. Originally known for viral videos and a documentary from the creator iDubs with over 24 million views, he recently did a live stream of himself crying for safety. Not feeling super safe right now. Why does he feel like he's in danger? Well, many have begun to claim that he is being held hostage in a remote location by a drug dealer named Blaze, who is using Chris's GoFundMe page as a money laundering front for an illegal drug operation. He has this GoFundMe because he was on the show Fish Tank run by iDub's arch nemesis Sam Hyde, with the community rallying in his support to give him a home. But now videos critical of the influencer are being struck down as claims of animal abuse and illicit weed enterprise and psychological manipulation persist. But after months of correspondence, I convinced Blaze as well as Chris to let me visit their secret whereabouts to discover the truth. And what I learned next is not what I expected. Are you nervous? A little nervous. You never know what people are capable of. I don't know what's going to happen. This place is really in the, out in the middle of nowhere. I drove hours of just seeing trees on the side of the road to get to this place. Well, hello there. How's it going, Chris? How's nice it going? You. How you doing? Nice to meet you. So this is the tiny house. Yeah. Very nice. It's well, not uh, crazy, but it's nice and cozy. <laughs> so Robert, are you living in the tiny house currently? No, I'm just out here for the month. Are, are you like staying while you're here in the tiny yeah, house? Yeah, I'm staying here while I'm here. So can you kind of give me like a little bit of a rundown of what your plans are for the winter? Because I know it gets pretty cold up here. <laughs> it's coming. <laughs> oh, you yeah. feel it right now. For winter, we're prepared. We heat taped all the pipes and shit. Very but nice. It's been a big still, crazy set. Honestly, bro, I keep saying and people are like, oh, it's nice. It's done. It's like 80% done. Yeah. Like, yeah. Yeah. We still got a lot of things to do. A lot of situation made the worst, you know? I mean, it's going to get colder in the winter, but I'm a Michigan man. I got plenty of body fat on me. And over here, where all the magic happens with the throne. We got the insulation in here just so it's a little warmer, a little more toastier because, well, coming out here at 3 a.m. to take a piss. Let's go. This is your land. You just had to build it here, and there's no issues. So he's safe here as long as he wants to stay. He still wants his own property. I don't blame him. But as long as he wants to stay here, it's fine here. Can we, get a, can we get a tour of the inside of it? Yeah, Chris, oh, give him a tour. MTV Nothing dreams. as much to a tour. All right, all right. <laughs> right now we've got queen cows over there taking over the bed. Right underneath, sure that... we got Robert's floor mattress. Got ourselves a nice little table that's functional. Just throw it back up there if we ever need to for space. Otherwise, pull it out for a good sesh. And then you come over to the work area with the PC and just behind you, the shower itself. Then of course we have the top of the line kitchen, aka electric stove, sink that barely fits the faucet. And honestly, you couldn't ask for anything better. It's a nice little log cabin out in the middle of nowhere where I get to live and enjoy life. Very nice. And every night I got the best view of the stars. Oh. Midnight to 1 a.m. you step out there to use the bathroom and you're just stuck on. This is what poets used to write about. This, this right here. They're like, this place must reek of weed, and it, it smells really good in here. As I'm They're grinding up the weed. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but we air it out. We this he usually has all the windows open if it's not uh, too cold. So how's the kitten doing? Oh, she's doing great. She's gotten like three times the size since I got her. How's it going? A little sweetheart. I want her to get another at least 0. 0.5 times her size right now before I'm comfy being like, okay, let's get you chipped and let's let you go outside and have some fun. He was over here lonely yeah. and stuff. I, you know, I'm sure you heard about his last cat or yeah. yeah. So I was like, you know what? Hey, Chris. And I stay on top of it. Like he's changed. You heard him. He changed the litter. You know. You look around and you see the shit. It's like it's definitely not anything weird like that. One of the biggest fucking weird shit is like he shot his cat's eye out. They ha it had one eye when they fucking rescued it. I'll tell the actual story to him real quick. They don't understand the fucking. Cause they wouldn't do that. For there was a cat. so yeah, much exactly. fucking. There was so much fucking work saving the one eye Preston got to fucking keep, and I hate it. I hate it that people keep saying I shot his eye out. That poor bastard did not have his eye shot out. He had some college chick watch him fucking wither to death under a deck for two fucking weeks in the middle of a fucking snowstorm. That cat story is so fucking intense. It just. He didn't even know what happened to mother. Again, he's not perfect. Dude's learning. He's 
fucking getting by every day. It is what it is. That's life, but... Half that shit is so far-fetched, it's, like, sick. And if it wasn't so crazy, it'd kind of be funny. So it's the morning after we arrive to meet up with Chris, and I am currently staying in Bangor, Maine, which is the closest town to where he lives. And it's a very remote city um, surrounded by just forest. And it turns out my Airbnb is actually only a block away from where Stephen King lives. And this is actually the inspiration for Dairy Maine in all of his books. On top of that, it's Halloween time around here, and the biggest mass shooting in Maine history just occurred, and there's a manhunt to find the shooter. It's uh, a bit unsettling, to say the least. But uh, today we are supposed to meet with Chris and do some interviews with them in town. I was born pretty much considered a dead man. I wasn't even supposed to survive being in the womb. Told I was gonna be born a waterhead baby, that I was gonna make it, and yet I made it. And immediately coming out the womb, what happened? Well, intensive care unit, because this guy is seizuring up immediately outside the gut. I've survived many different moments, but that right there is where it all starts, because I said fuck you to death. I spent most of my life in a relatively decent childhood, I wanna say. Uh, father was always there up until he passed. Other who cared was there for me. Even when she ended up uh, getting diagnosed with the same disease that took him, she was still there supporting me, it was one of my biggest supporters of my career. The house was in really rough shape because I didn't take care of it. I didn't care for it like I should have. Uh, my mother, of course, being sick, didn't have the money because of all that going towards treatment. Didn't really have the time to invest into it like I should have. Um, and the house fell apart. But I'm honestly surprised that house held up as long as it did. Growing up, me and Robert were best friends. I cannot remember the exact meeting at this point. We were definitely like one, two years old, and it's like our families kind of knew each other. We're family at the end of the day. He's the one person I know where if I needed him, I can I can make one single phone call and say, hey Chris, I need your help, and, he, and he'd be there pretty much instantly. Started the whole YouTube thing way back in 2014 as kind of uh, an escape. Uh, we had just had a scare where mother, um, we thought we were going to lose her. It you know, you, you just sit there and you're just like, well, shit, is this the day? Am I going to have to, like, find us a home soon? And so I decided to start YouTube as kind of a alternative, you know, take my, uh, take my mind off of things. In the early days, Chris's content consisted of vlogs. Some were cooking videos, some were about airsoft guns, and others were lightsaber duel videos with Robert. Three, two, one. Ah, hit. That's eight. Nine. Admittedly, the content was quite amateur in nature, but made simply for the joy of creation, rather than with any intention of being seen by the wider online community. Unbeknownst to either of them, however, this is exactly what would soon happen. Well, it kind of blew up unexpectedly. I never thought I'd get over 100 subs. Me and my friend Robert have been making a bunch of lightsaber videos and Star Wars lore videos for about a year at that point. Been producing video, at least on my own, for about two at that point. We make this video, it's called uh, When Lightsaber Dueling Goes Horribly Wrong, parentheses, watch till the end. The one where, where I knocked that fat ass over a cement bear statue. Anger is not the way of the jet. Oh. Oh. <laughs> you okay? Oh. I ass. hope you got that. Oh, are you good, bro? Ouch. Shit. Just, I hope you got that. I hope you got that. Just off, it on Tosh Point all picked it up and it was a good episode. So what do you say, young Padawan? Based off the body, I think he's dressed up as George Lucas. I've never really gave a fuck about the fame. I originally started doing videos of Chris because frankly I was bored, had nothing better to do, and it was fun. But no, it was, uh, that was kind of that first initial push and that got us to about, I wanna say 10,000 subs before Ian finally hit us up. Um. What is going full force? That is where, and the way I define it, someone is treating it as if they're about to die and they are putting everything behind it. I was just kind of chilling one day, uh, just literally just chilling in my room, just taking some bits out of the bong when I got a message on Instagram and checked it out. Said it was from uh, iDove's TV. At first I played it off, I was like, there's no, there's no fucking way this is Ian. There's no way this is iDubs. There's no way this dude that's got millions of subscribers is interested in me with barely breaking 112. 
we started chatting and he was just like, yeah, I'm trying to like change up my stuff. I want to do more documentary type stuff. And I wanted to know if you'd be willing to have me come out and document you for a bit. Chris sent me a message saying, hey, hey iDubs is coming out to interview us. My answer response was, who the fuck is iDubs? And why does he want to come out and interview two, two dumb asses from the middle of nowhere? And day comes, I'm upstairs taking a hit, playing a game. And I hear my mother call up, yo, I think he's here. I look out the window. Sure enough, two SUVs pull up and I'm like, this is actually happening? Ian was given a tour of the premises, which had fallen into disarray, as did the friendship between him and Robert. The two had stopped speaking after a disagreement over an airsoft gun, leading to a hostile relationship upon the filming of the documentary. And it's only a duel. It's still would be a no. And I wouldn't suggest you duel him either because he will hurt you. It was a complete misunderstanding on my part and I lost it. So my temper flared. Cause at the time I still had more than 10 years of emotions bottled up, which I, I know now that wasn't a good thing. I became extremely violent. It wasn't until recently that I actually decided to let go of the vast majority. I kept like, I guess four years worth of anger just to use it the situation called for it. Oh, okay, so someone else is gonna fuck over the world, it's not you. Well, it's me, just a different side of me. Oh, okay, so you're talking about your demon. Oh. Yeah. Exactly. I thought he was an okay dude until a couple minutes into the interview, then I realized, man, this guy's a condescending dick. And I started bullshitting just to see how he react. Uh, what's your demon's name? I can't translate it in human, but he's saying and calling himself, calling himself Death. Most of the demon shit was a bit of bullshit and a bit of a very active imagination. Do you think Idubs knew you were doing it for show or did he actually believe it? Well, he chuckled every now and then, so I have a feeling he knew it was bullshit. During filming, I didn't think this at the time. I wasn't thinking about it. But it came up for a condescending the way he was filming. I look back at that now, at that documentary, and uh, I'm not like the biggest fan of it. But it, I also view it as an important piece of media for myself. So the only kind of form of payment I ever got for Full Force was about a week after that video released, he sent me an airsoft gun. Despite some grievances, Chris would experience a huge increase in popularity following the release of Full Force, and would continue to make content as revenue began to grow. However, more trials would soon face the now beloved internet figure, as he would face his mother dying of cancer just two months after its release. Chris called me up, said, hey Robert, I, I need you, Mom, uh, mom's dying. And I was like, well shit, come get me then. And I spent a month up until Sue passed at Chris's place, making sure he was, making sure he was all right. November, I get told by my cousin, oh, this is my house. Your mother left the house to me. Come to find out somehow in 2016, when she went down again and was halfway in a coma, he somehow convinced her to send the house over to him when she dies. Of course she passes a couple weeks later, he comes by. Here's an eviction notice. She got one week to find a house for uh, nearly 40 cats, you got a dog you gotta find a home for, and two geckos, and well, good luck, I ain't fucking help you with that. The day I went to start moving, the kitchen ceiling collapsed on top of me, and my friends had to dig me out. But it brought down the ceiling, the light fixture, it brought down some of the tiling with it. And it wasn't like just one section, it was the whole kitchen ceiling at once. That was a moment where I kind of had a shock of, yeah, no, you can't take care of this house. You can't handle this. You've, I don't know, you just don't have the skill to do it. Later come to find out he went and had my dog put down. A four-year-old St. Bernard. And it's sad because again, you tell people about this, you're open about it. Not everyone wants to believe it. There were patterns. He had, he had stored an old jet ski on our property, right? Well, one day when I was about, I don't wanna say maybe eight, nine years old, he got upset with me because I said I wasn't gonna help him move it. He got pissed, picked me up in the middle of playing Call of Duty and throws me into the TV. Bam! 
And you see as I'm starting to get shocked because electronics, so he fucking unplugs it. You hear my mother come in, what the fuck just happened? Oh, Christopher just fell on the TV. And in the moment, you know, I'm in shock, I'm in pain, I'm trying to get up, get the glass out of me. When you look back at some of this shit, you really question why I still wish the best for some people. It just, I don't like talking about it like that because it almost comes off cynical. I, I don't know, I'm trying to be a better person and be happier. With nowhere to go and still being on bad terms with friends like Robert, even after they briefly reconciled, Chris was forced to move in with the very same cousin who had taken possession of his house. His living arrangement while here was dire to say the least, with his days spent mainly in the backyard. While staying with them, the rules for me were, you wake up at 6 a.m., you get the dishes done, and then you go back to the shed. The sliding door had busted windows. The door that you actually used to get in was busted off. We were getting hit with some major snowstorms. We had that polar vortex that came in and days were hitting, you know, net between zero and negative 20. I'm not allowed to put up cardboard to keep the cold out. I'm not allowed to have an electric heater out there because according to my aunt, who was his mother, you'd be frying the electronics inside doing that. I could come in to take a shit, piss, and make some food, but I had to take the food out there to eat it. But there were moments where I would just like break down and stream. I just mentally wasn't in a good spot. I let mental things get to me. I let trolls get to me for a while and I kind of made my own mistakes. Eventually, about, after about a month or two of staying with my aunt and cousin, I said, fuck this. I, I'm literally staying in a shed where I'm dying every day of fucking frostbite. And then when I come back in, I gotta listen to my aunt tell me how much of a waste of space and oxygen I am and how it's my own fault my mother fucking died and how it's my own fault everything's happened. It's like, are you serious? So there was just a day where I just went, you know what? Fuck you, I'm taking my shit. I'm getting the fuck out of here. I don't know what's gonna happen. When I was forced out, I was allowed to take one photo album and the absolute necessities I needed to work. That meant my PC, my Xbox One, a couple of my guns, a couple of my sabers, and maybe a week's worth of clothes. He has tossed every photo album out of that house, tossed every family heirloom, tossed all my mother's jewelry, tossed everything. I met up with him and he goes, here's your shit, you're being served. And I look and I go, this isn't a serve, this is a petition. You're pet petitioning the court to have my rights taken away? He's like, I'm saying nothing else and just leaves. I spent maybe a month and a half in the van just living out of that. I spent Thanksgiving homeless. I spent Christmas homeless. And so they had me on like, my God, like 12 different pills a day. And a lot of them were antipsychotics. And just to give you an idea, I don't know if you know what Seroquel is, but it's something that they give people with very extreme issues of sleep. And it is like a tranquilizer. It will hit you fast, it hits you hard, it will knock you the fuck out. In the morning, I was taking something like 400 milligrams. And at night, I was taking five. The whole day I was zombie. At that time, along with being drugged up most of the time, along with roommating with someone at the time who was very unhinged, uh, I was dealing with what I call the Josh era of things. During the time Chris spent in this chaotic situation, he sought out help to maximize revenue from his videos by hiring a friend named Josh as a social media manager who promised to help with his chronic homelessness. Unfortunately, this would only result in more troubles. Now, Josh is the, and I'm gonna be blunt, the biggest piece of shit that I have ever met. I had originally known Josh as a weed guy. I'd hit him up, get some weed. Uh, and that's usually what it was. One day after my mother passed away, I was a day after I'd actually attempted to take my life. When we were younger, it got, I talked to Chris off the lights enough times that I may not have been getting paid for it, but I considered it my job. And that's the crazy part, right? Originally, when Josh came in, it was, like I said, under the guise of wanting to help me. He originally didn't want to see payment for like six months until I got back on my feet. That's what the original idea was. But it's slowly, over time, just little things would change up with him that just became so bad. It was when I first started taking him to work is when he first started really going at me. I would have to wake up every morning about 7 a.m., be to his place by eight, give him the driver's seat so he could drive to work. The process of the hour long drive for work is screaming in my face, calling me retard, fucking made fun of my parents, told me it's my, my own fault that both of my parents had died. And at the time I was just so mentally fucked, I just sat there and took it cause like, hey, this dude's in my corner, he's trying to help me. And then when I say, dude, I just want some basic respect from you. Like I have a fucking name. 
And once I'd get to that point, it's, shut the fuck up, bro. I'm going to crash this fucking van in that tree over there. I don't give a fuck. I'll kill you. I don't fucking care. And it's like, motherfucker, I'm living out of this fucking van right now. And that went on up until I finally got an apartment. As time went on, the situation would escalate. Chris would be forced to stream for longer and produce more content on YouTube to increase revenue, while at the same time, the agreement between him and his business partner became murky. He starts editing the contract without me knowing it, because we just did a simple DocuSign contract. It wasn't even notarized by anyone, which is something that at the time I hadn't realized and was the very thing he was using to scare the hell out of me from running was this contract. Basically, the original contract was, he was gonna do some work with me for free for a few months to help me get back on my feet. And then after a few months, we were supposed to sit down and negotiate a good pay for him, because I didn't want to pay him, because we were just starting to take back off. After the first month, I found out the contract was edited to where he basically collected around 70 to 90% of my money that I would make would go to him. And the newer version of the contract was worded in a way that any money I would have made counted towards that. So if I would have went and gotten a job completely separated from content creation, he'd collect 70 to 90% of that. He was taking Chris's money and using it to like fix up a BMW. Over the process of the time he had been with me, he, he had gotten enough out of me to completely rebuilt his 350i. He bought his mother's house. That motherfucker right now has a house over his head because of me, because I was too weak to say no. During that time, because he was setting up so many brand deals that I didn't even fucking know about, mind you, but he was setting up brand deals, the dispensaries and things like that, that were making between, I, again, I don't want to give exact, so I'll just get ballpark here, between one and 6,000 a month. Chris would face other problems as a result of his living situation at the time made worse by his now decreased income. Even after escaping homelessness, his new roommates would prove to be an issue. Start working with Josh. Eventually, after being homeless for a while, we get the apartment. I'm staying with Aaron. Aaron's almost killed me multiple times. And that's that's not something I mess around with here. Multiple times I'd go to talk to him. Every month it'd be like, hey, Aaron, we need to talk about bills. That's not my fucking responsibility. I don't know why the fuck you're coming to me about this. Going to the kitchen, grabs a fucking knife. I swear to God, I'm gonna kill myself. Start sawing. So of course I go at him, he's my friend. I'm not gonna let this dude fucking kill himself. So of course I'm usually tackling him. We're on the ground, he turns the knife on me, and now it's two fucking 300 plus pound men fighting to keep a knife going on one and the other wants to go for it while I'm on the phone with the police. Yeah, motherfucker, get over here, he's fucking on top of me. I have more knowledge on how to clean up a crime scene than I ever, ever desire wanting to know. Yeah, Chris's living situation at the time wasn't the best. But I think that was mainly because of Josh taking most of Chris's funds. I was living in that situation in an apartment that was two bedrooms, barely enough to cover rent, barely enough to get a week's worth of food, usually at a time. He even had the two-fact authentication on his phone for Chris's shit. Every time that I would get upset, try to stand up to him, he'd change the passwords, he'd go right to his screaming fits. Did Idubs know that stuff was going on with you? I don't think he did. At the time, I think my fear was if I hit him up and, you know, Josh is right and this is how a man is supposed to treat their people, I'm going to be the one looking stupid and I was too afraid to reach out. So I guarantee if I reached out to him and said, this is what's going on, Ian would have been like, yeah, no, that's not how they should be talking to you at all. Chris was convinced that Josh was right. Josh knew what he was doing. And, he, and Chris is like me in a way. Once he sets his mind in a certain mind space, it is very hard to convince him otherwise. It's just, it was so much. And I don't blame people who don't believe some of this shit because you really had to be there to see it. And it was a fucking, one of the worst moments for me because I wasn't mentally there. I wasn't emotionally there. I wasn't even physically there. For all intents and purposes, he made Chris dependent on him for everything. He had Chris's van that Chris has had for five years towed. The whole van situation was he got pissed at me one night. He told me to take my van, park it down the road of the gas station by his place. Of course, the process of a week being there, the van has to get towed at that point. And I found out later that he had done that on purpose because he wanted me reliant completely on him. Are you kidding me? After a week of it being in that lot, they wanted four grand. And the worst part is I lost a lot more of my um, family stuff. 
when that happened. My mother's ashes and a photo album up there. I had things like an old painting. I had my dad's war bonds in there. I had a few other things that were just, you know, sentimental type stuff that I'm not getting back. The actions of those surrounding Chris went largely unnoticed for a period of time. This started to change though during a live stream, in which his supposed management called him out on camera to work harder as they would be able to make more money from him. I quit my job to help you, not because I knew that it was going to make me money. No, I did it because I wanted to help you and I didn't have enough time going to work and helping you because you are so much to handle that I can't work and help you. My whole thought process when I saw what Josh was doing was, I'm going to do what I have to to help Chris get out of the situation. Josh actually contacted me on Instagram to reunite me with Chris. And I knew instantly that he was going to try to use me. Josh says, yo, I'm helping Robert out uh, too. And of course at the time I'm getting worse mentally. I'm thinking, oh, they're just gonna steal my fucking channel. and." leave me high and dry like he's been doing. That's what I was worried about. When in reality, uh, Robert has since explained it to me as he wanted to act like a Trojan horse. That was my whole intent on getting back in contact with Josh and Chris was to pull a Trojan war tactic from the Greece. I was not his friend. I wanted him to think I was his friend, but in the end, I was gonna fuck him over. Robert was originally brought on to revive the waning viewership of the Airsoft Fatty channel. But little did Josh know that he was actually a secret agent who worked with a fan named Supervisor to secretly record incriminating conversations to help Chris out. I actually have someone in my Discord server that helped me get in touch with Supervisor. He's another guy who was working to expose, expose Josh and I had him forward the voice clips to Supervisor I sent him screenshots. I pulled out all the stops to expose Josh. Yeah, that's here. It's, you're a celebrity. You're not fucking the onion. You're not the next person that stole it. If their apartment's clean, I don't give a shit. Including allowing him to put his bank account on my AdSense. But of course, it, my AdSense didn't pay out to him because at the time I hadn't verified my billing address yet. He thought he was using me when in, the other, when in reality I was setting him up to fall. But uh, a, lot of, a lot of the whole Robert and Josh situation, I don't know every little thing about. What I do know is how I reacted, what I perceived, and acknowledging that now I'm more mature, now that I'm more able to slow down and perceive things, I can see where I was wrong. After Chris kind of yelled at me for sending the voice clips to Supervisor, we lost contact for a while. We didn't really want anything to do with each other for a little bit. I finally reached out to someone that I've been working with at the time uh, called Cookie. We were kind of getting friendly, so I called him up. I was like, yo, dude, look, this is the situation. I got this dude screaming in my face how I'm a piece of shit. He's left me with no money. I have to fucking move tomorrow. And he goes, get the U-Haul, get up here. Don't even worry about it, we'll deal with him. Took process of a couple of weeks. It took a lawyer getting involved, but eventually Josh gives me my shit back, most of it. In that process, I had found out that he had something that he was using back during that time to extort me, which is another thing I didn't really bring up, the nude. I have only ever sent and taken one nude in my life. I was in a relationship at the time online. He hacks my Facebook, steals the photo, just the photo, doesn't screenshot anything else, and then deletes that Facebook. So he used that for for that whole year and a half there was one of his little weapons. Between the money, the contract, he'd always say, you can't get out of the contract without paying me. He was just kind of content with me going live every day, getting upset, getting worked up, having trolls make clips of that. And at the time I just was too fucked up, not recovered enough to really see that, understand and pull myself away. Mods, if we could have you guys work your job on that asshole, that'd be great. Especially since I'm well and ready to take legal action after what I saw today on uh, a certain website. Yeah, so they need to fucking get taken care of. One day I came home from a walk and Josh was sitting right there in our living room. And I said, 
Cookie, what the fuck's he doing here? Oh, he's here to help me out with my channel and stuff. I was like, really, dude? After all the fucking shit he put me through like this? He comes in, well, yeah, he's been helping me out for a few months now. And like, I said, Cookie, do you not remember how like you found me when I was with him? Mind you, he was really good at manipulating people which honestly says quite a bit about Cookie, Gucci Berry, Aaron, that they're actually falling for his manipulations and shit. Like, I'm, I'm actually proud of Chris for actually kicking Josh to the curb. We may not have been talking at the time, but I'm actually quite proud of Chris. Yeah, so I'd actually, during the Josh situation, I've been on Twitch, I think twice, I can recollect. Uh, but the first time was that situation where we were live, it was one of those where I was tired and I kept falling asleep. And you can't fall asleep on Twitch like that because they'll take that, especially with me taking bong rips and stuff, they take that as you're getting too high to a point where it's self-harm. Um, so I caught the first ban from that. It was a two-day ban. We keep going live and eventually we do a stream where we're at Airsoft Alphonse where we took grenades to the chest and he was like, yo, let's go live and do this. And so they saw me take an actual impact explosive to the chest and well, Again, self-harm there. They think you're taking an actual C4 explosive to the chest. They don't want to take the moments to pick up on the, the little things. And that was a huge fight. That was almost a month long of trying to get that back because originally it was a permaban. During the time I was in the process of packing and getting things moved out, uh, I was over at Josh's place. We were doing a stream. Um, and it was one of those streams where I got in trouble because I was falling asleep. Again, while we were there, someone had called into the BCPD and said, my name's Christopher Lafon. I'm here with my mother. I just blew her fucking head off. Any motherfucking cop that comes to respond, I'm blowing their fucking brains out. So I was luckily enough away when it happened, when they came and kicked the door in and everything else. And I got a text from my neighbor in the morning saying, hey, why is the news outside your house? And I was like, what? I go let Josh know about it. And Josh's like, yeah, you got swatted last night. I didn't want to tell you. And then he shows me the fucking news article that they literally wrote the next morning. Like, uh, they never gave me any update on whether or not they caught the dude who did it or not. I still don't know if that dude's ever faced any trouble for it. And today, I wanted to do some for us air softers. What we're doing today is testing homemade reactive targets. Uh, there were two different points where we were, we were going to get evicted from that trailer because of money trouble. Because I'd, I'd give Cookie the money and then somehow within the next week we're behind that amount, but yet I gave you my cut. I hit Ian up the first time, he helped us out, copped up my half, helped me out. Second time when I was like, hey, I don't want money, I don't want to be that kind of guy where I'm just asking for money. Ian, I got to ask you, how do you do it? How do you reach out to some of these guys and get sponsorships going? Because I'm trying to get stuff going. It was roughly worded now that I'm thinking about it. It was something along the lines of, sometimes you have to cut the bleeding limb off and just get a job and give this up. He couldn't even like feed me two minutes. After that, like we talked here and there on and off. And then after Creator Clash, when I went out and did the Anthem Forum, we just kind of fell off. He has me blocked on every social media. It's like, I can't even hit the dude up and be like, yo, sorry about some of the petty shit if I wanted to, which is so fine by me because there's still some stuff I got a lot of problems with. You don't know how much that actually helps. You don't know how much that actually helps, to be honest. Chris's trolling grew worse around this time, with many emotional streams and the online public encouraging erratic behavior. However, it was then that he would encounter an important ally. I just don't know any smoke tricks. Only get high trick. That's the only thing. <laughs> Some people like through the nose oh, and shit. Yeah, I'm just like, nope. <laughs> I met Blaze around the time that I was hanging with Cookie towards the end of that time. Um, I do these events where I hold like a dab bar, consumption bar, education type stuff. I think I was like gonna send him some samples and shit and do a promo or something and then I was like, fuck it, come to these events. Come out, knock the event out. We just all kind of clicked and it meshed. We started hanging out more in Discord. We stayed in contact online, smoking and shit, uh, chit-chatting. And it gets to a point where I'm getting trolled so hard that people found out where I lived. No, they called my landlord, who's this older lady, and they started making death threats to her. Talking about, we know your car, we know where you park it, we're gonna come firebomb your shit and everything. They called threatened her to a point where she sat down with me and Cookie and his wife and said straight up, I either gotta evict all three of you or Chris has gotta go. I decided, hey, let's not make my friend and his wife relocate, but I'll relocate myself. I'll find my cat that I had at the time a, a place somewhere to go because I'm the one that has to leave. Chris called me out of nowhere 
hey dude, I'm getting evicted. I'm fucked. I literally, my landlord, like I think it was like within four days he had to be out. I'm fucked, can you help me? His big plan at the time was get a tattoo from like a cigarette company, the logo across their, his forehead. And I was like, he's like, can you look into this for me? It's legit. And I'm like, who told you this? And nah, you, ain't, you shouldn't do that then. My friend was telling me about Fish Tank like every day. Dude, you gotta look this show up. You gotta look this show up. Hey, Chris, you wanna go on a show where you can get like a month of free board and like make some money? I said, what do you mean? He goes, the Sam High kid, he's doing this show. He calls it Fish Tank. He says, it's like jackass meets, you know, full house type of shit. If you can get out here, he's gonna put you on and everything. You'll have a place basically, if you can hold out, if you can deal with this for a month, you will have a free place for a month and you'll be making money. And I said, you know what? Fly me out, let's do it. Cause I was like, yo, you should have Airsoft Fatty in the tank I, and I'll get him there. And he was like, oh yeah, you know Airsoft Fatty? I was like, yeah, and that's legit. I flew him out, I paid for his flight and we got him to the, the house and that's, it was very organic and you know, just kind of happened the way it happened. So it had nothing to do with getting back at iDubs. But Joey, can you open up the iDubs gaslighting document? So you're punking me. I'm not punking you, I'm trying to make a, I'm, I was, um, I thought it'd be funny for your fans, I think they'd like it. She's gotta go, man. She's gonna, she's gonna ruin his life. So yeah, now that this guy is on the daily insulting my wife, I think it's pretty fair to, you know, not want to associate with him. No, uh, and uh, I don't know how much I'm supposed to reveal here, but literally we were told, don't mention him, it ain't about that. I think the whole show, like the whole thing was just such an organic uh, thing that, when put together the right time and right everything, it just worked out for everybody involved. Chris, come on in. Hello, everybody. Hey. Are we ready to make some art? Yep. Can we get some fucking personality? Oh, yeah. This is a good, okay, thank you. Wow. Oh my God, so the time that I fell on the stairs, because you can see I step, and it seems like I'm all good, I go to step again, that's when I fall. <laughs> and what had happened was I hit my chin, and as I slid it was ka-thunk, 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 ka-thunk. Yeah, that sucks, it's gonna be funny as hell to see, and then you see it on the online, and you think to yourself, damn, if only I could've done that pantless. Is your dick and balls out or something? Yes! Okay, I can't see it. Yes. A hundred percent yes. At one point, they were all like, yeah, being nude's totally fine. And at first, I wasn't gonna do it. But I thought about it as I was going through the, um, the show. I thought to myself, I said, this could be a major fuck you to Josh. I could go naked right fucking now and have more eyes on me than Josh would ever have with that photo. Let's see what else? How about uh, the, you had blackface on at one point? Oh um, my, that's one of the that's one of the few little things that I do regret. No! No! Of course, you're on that show. You're at your mental wits end. You're exhausted. You've got all this crazy shit going on. You're not mentally in the right space. If I wasn't so crazy at the time, I probably wouldn't have done it. And I still regret it to this date. Chris. Oh, Oh my God. Okay. So that was a legit hooker. That was a legit lady of the night. Legitimately, we were gonna fuck. But of course, things happen. You're also in a very gross home with a bunch of shit happening. It's like frat house meets jackass. I was like massaging you. There's something on like yeah, your so butt crack. Old stage from fucking airsofting. What's Slide that? Dirt. Old stage from airsofting. Sliding dirt. Okay, I'm like, it looks like poop stains. I got scared. You're good. Okay, well, I definitely need some more money now because I'm, um, you know. Yeah, I just, I took that real personally. And I think if I had just came back out, fucking stopped moping, probably would have had some fun. That's, that's like the number three thing I think I regret the most, is not coming back and saying, fuck it, give another shot. <laughs> but while on the show, I found out they had started to go fuck me for me. And I was like, no way. That next time I came down for an interview, I told them, hey, make sure that like the only person who has any access to this stuff and info and things like that, has gotta be Blaze. He's the one person I trust. His decision, how did he come to the decision to stay here? It was kind of a uh, necessity, I think, and also just, it worked. And he goes, Chris, uh, I know you, you're thinking about getting an apartment and stuff, but I mean, you look at that 20, it's, it's not really gonna, 
You'll get a place for a year, but you really won't have a permanent spot. He goes, why don't you get a converted home? Get one of those converted shed homes. Sure, it's not glorious, but I got a spot you can put it. You know, build it up so you actually own it so no one can get you kicked out again. While people were happy to see Airsoft Fatty with a roof over his head, the high donations paired with Blaze's sudden appearance in Chris's life came off as suspicious to the online public. Given what had happened with the Josh situation and Blaze's lack of an online presence, he was quickly seen in a negative light, with some speculating that the high donations were part of a possible money laundering scheme, that Blaze was running to hide the supposed earnings of an illegal marijuana farm. No, everything I do is medical. Um, it's, I've been involved in the medical program since like 2016. Where we're at, it's completely legal medically and recreationally. So if you're not laundering money through the GoFundMe, who's paying that money? Like 600 different people, but where's the big chunks of money coming from is a specific person, and they're just a generous person, I guess. I really don't know too much. We've reached out to her. I, I'm going to be dead ass honest right now. Look, if you're out, I'm not going to say your name because you know who you are. But if you want to go have a dinner with me, I'm more than open to the idea because or at least a as a way, and even a couple just, I want to show some appreciation because that's a lot. That That's that's more money than I used to see in a year. So like, Ain't that, the that truth. is, well, fuck you, man. <laughs> People he wasn't trying to be your manager. He was no, trying to he better wasn't. Your wife. People thought he was trying to do what Josh was doing. Like, He's not. Like you can call them trolls, but really they are his fans. And I have had to come to this realization that like, it's one hand washed the other. It's it's part of the system. I'm not used to this shit, somebody fucking with my friend. And ha again, half the shit is bullshit. So when I know it's bullshit, because I'm here and I see him firsthand, it, it pisses me off. But an episode of our podcast and a stream key we did a few months ago were just randomly taken offline the other day and one of Kiwi's channels was hit with a copyright strike. A false copyright strike, may I add. Those videos that are in question were flagged by copyright ID, content ID on YouTube's automatic system. And we did hit removal. I'm not the guy that really makes that final decision as much as it seems like it is. If anybody wanted to reach out and talk to Chris and work this shit out, for sure. Like we have talked to a few people who aren't doing flattering videos on Chris that he does want to talk to and he probably will work with. So it's not like he wouldn't do an interview with them or something too. It's nobody's actually reached out to us for anything like that. While this explanation for the video takedowns might be unsatisfactory, at the very least I can confirm that there's no evidence that illegal activity has occurred. Regardless, a backlash towards Blaze has worsened by a live stream that took place before I visited, where Chris appeared to be in physical danger. Not feeling super safe right now, so I'm kind of just going live to make sure something happens. Uh, they did sort of use witnessed. Uh, so that stream right there, yeah, it was kind of like a PTSD moment in a way. Just to address everyone out there, I am fine. I am safe. It was just me panicked going through an, an overwhelming load of emotion at the time. Before Blaze, Chris was a complete, I guess you could say clusterfuck? I really, even if I panic, even if I relapse, know that I am in the safest fucking place I can be. If I talk about ever wanting to hurt myself, I have a dude that will literally drive at 150 miles an hour to get to me as fast as he can. I have not been able to sleep easier or take deeper breaths in a very long time because of it. We didn't really want anything to do with each other for a little bit until, of course, Blaze hit me up about, what was it, two, three months ago? Chris and me were kind of just talking about it. And actually, a lot of it was like he was bringing up nostalgia, memories, and every time it was like, and you could ask Robert, and Robert was right there, and you could ask Robert. He was like, look at every time you got upset with him. Look at every time y'all have had a fight. It is always because someone said something, and you two couldn't communicate at the time in the right way to get that dealt with. And I was like, damn, you're right. I hit Robert up and I was like, bro, you got, you and Chris gotta talk. You gotta work out your differences. You, you guys should be friends again. It basically snowballed from there and now I'm actually physically here with Chris. And you know what? I couldn't be happier. I've got my best friend back. And I tell you what, there is no 
more relaxing and just uh, of a feeling of just being like, yep, that guy right there, that guy's been there, that guy has seen me at my worst, that guy has seen me at my best, that's the motherfucker I want carrying my ring as a ring bearer, that's the dude that I want carrying my casket. And when I heard, truthfully, that Robert's never made a dollar for any YouTube video he's in, I actually said to Chris, like, what the fuck, man? So to me, that's a real friend. As far as him getting here and staying here, it kind of just worked out like that. I'm actually seriously considering moving down here permanently. He's got his issues, everybody does, but he's he hasn't threatened anybody, you know, he doesn't go for any crazy shit. He's just, he's just a regular dude that's got some issues, you know? I don't tend to go full force anymore because there was a couple times where Chris would make me angry and despite him being my brother we'd go out front with lightsabers and I'd then proceed to try to kill him. I'm actually in a way better spot mentally than I was back then. I'm just proud of what he's accomplished in the short amount of time that he's had and what he did with it. The people who promote me getting better, promote me getting back on track success. And I mean, it's showing. <laughs> We're back to making content regularly. We're back to having fun. We're back to smiling genuinely and like, and I'm happy. Whoa. Uh, can only be one. <laughs> hey there. Hey. You know what they call my saber? Pregnant anthrax. It's like a pregnancy I'm unexpected, and like anthrax, it gets the kill. Oh dear God. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't give a straight face with the. I guess I did the ultimate tactic. <laughs> Pokemon, learn from this. The confusion status sucks. We need the giggle status. Ah, Koopa, what are you thinking? You already got the Mohawk hair. Oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah. Oh, no. Ow! Dick! Ah. So that's one point for him. That shit got me in the dick. <laughs> Come on, guy. Ah, man. Fucking wrist, man. <laughs> Get him, Robert. God damn it! Oh, oh. Oh. Holy shit! Oh, you want it.